Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Parm Eftikari, the Executive Director in uh, the Cybersecurity Collaborative, and I'm thrilled to welcome all of you to the first in a new series that we're hosting here call, called Leadership Profiles. I want to extend a special welcome to our Cybersecurity Collaborative members who are joining us today, and of course to our uh, leaders that we're going to be profiling. Now, like everything at the Cybersecurity Collaborative, uh, the idea behind this came uh, from requests from our members who are seeking uh, more uh, inspiration and more support around professional development and leadership development. So the goal behind this series and what we're really going to uncover today is to um, identify uh, leaders and people that we all look up to and typically hear from uh, in speak uh, events and these days and in virtual briefings uh, on cyber issues, but actually flip the script and actually start to hear from them and ask them questions uh, and learn a bit more about their personalities and what their characteristics are and really what motivates them in an effort to basically have almost like mini mentoring sessions where we can learn and glean from them and hopefully apply some of uh, the things that have helped them accomplish such greatness in their careers and apply those things to our own lives. And uh, um, I'm gonna kind of uh, share with you that um, I'm extra excited about this session because both Ron and Jerry are, are dear personal friends of mine uh, who have uh, helped shape my career and, and I owe a lot to them, uh, both as friends and as colleagues and, and, and as, as, uh, as uh, inspirations of mine. So I'm very excited to share uh, with all of you some of the things that I've been learning from these guys for many, many years now. Uh, before we get started, uh, there may be some of you who don't know a lot about the Cybersecurity Collaborative. So let me just spend a quick minute introducing you to our organization. We essentially exist to help protect the nation and its citizens against cyber threats. And we know that the best way to do that is to help ensure that the cybersecurity leaders out there, all of you, are strong and have the best tools uh, from a strategic and technical insights perspective to do your jobs, as well as are developed as cybersecurity professionals and leaders uh, to uh, be effective in communication and in getting the buy-in across the spectrum within your organization to advance the ball. And so what we do is, and is essentially we've built a mission-oriented uh, membership collaborative uh, where we provide services for our members to facilitate that peer-to-peer -peer dialogue and collaboration uh, where there's no vendors, there's no analysts who are driving and deciding what's being discussed. It's actually our members who are practitioners and CISOs and executives from organizations across government and across the 16 critical infrastructure sectors uh, throughout the nation. Uh, we provide different content and resources developed by members and by CISOs. Uh, providing tools and insights and tactics in a private members portal. And of course, we have a different professional development um, resources to support uh, leadership and mentoring and all sorts of fantastic uh, uh, um, um, resources uh, for the membership. Um, we are supported by a, an executive committee uh, of global CISOs um, who are household names in our industry, leaders from organizations like Yums and Aflac and Campbell Soup and JP Morgan Chase. Rockwell Automation, who are at the pinnacle and top of our organization, who are constantly uh, um, educating and inspiring uh, our members, but also validating the approach that we're taking to growing the organization. And, and the values that drive us are grounded in respect and kindness uh, and integrity uh, and trust uh, and, and, and inclusion and, and diversity uh, are, are very important to our organization uh, and everything that we do. And that's a little bit about us. Uh, um, again, welcome to our members. Uh, for those of you who are new to us, uh, we're, we're excited to be um, engaging with you. And now we're excited to get to the main events. And so I'm going to go ahead and start by introducing our uh, leaders for the day. Uh, first is uh, Jerry Davis. For those of you who may not know Jerry, uh, Jerry is the uh, CSO. Uh, I'm sorry, Jerry has, uh, has had several leadership roles over the course of his distinguished career. Uh, they have included the uh, Chief, Global Chief Security Officer at LAM Research, uh, CIO at NASA Ames Research Center, uh, other C-level positions at cabinet-level agencies, including the Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, Department of Education. Um, we want to thank Jerry for his service, um, both at the Marine Corps and uh, in the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, Jerry's also done a number of uh, mentorship and other leadership uh, volunteer efforts, including being a, a fellow at the Institute for Critical Infrastructure Technology, the nation's leading cyber think tank. So, Jerry, it's uh, great to have you here. We're excited to chat with you today. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Thank you, Paul. Absolutely. And of course, uh, a, a man who uh, doesn't always need any introductions because we all know who he is, uh, Dr. Ron Ross. Uh, Ron has been uh, a fellow at NIST 
uh, where he served for over 22 years. We all know that Ron is uh, um, uh, one of the lead authors and, and a driver behind so many of the publications that NIST puts out, which are not only used in the government uh, here in the United States, but to lead governments around the world and, and as a foundation for so many organizations, small, medium, at large, to help improve resiliency across those organizations. Um, I remember actually Jerry and I were having uh, dinner with a senator from Japan, and he was talking about how they wanted to implement the risk management framework for the Japanese government. And, uh, and uh, this was um, before the pandemic actually kicked in. Um, Ron, also, we want to thank you for your service for 20 years in the US Army. And Ron has uh, you know, uh, received countless awards um, uh, and really is one of our industry's icons. And so, Ron, we want to welcome you today and, and, and thank you for being here. Uh, I'm happy to be here, Parm. It's, it's just great honor and privilege to be on the webinar, especially with my good friend, uh, Jerry Davis, uh, who's, who has been a member of two of my favorite organizations ever, NASA and the Marine Corps. So it's a pleasure to be here with him today as well. Well, I think, you know, like I mentioned, the goal here is to, 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 to understand and educate the, the audience a bit more about not necessarily your views on cybersecurity, but how it is that you guys have achieved so many great things in your career. You, you, you both have, are with some of the most renowned organizations in our industry. You've re achieved the highest heights uh, that one could a, would attain for uh, in the industry. And I think people, uh, especially in the lower levels of their career and who are just getting started, want to know, gosh, what do I need to do to get there? What do I need to study? Um, you know, what, what, what tools uh, do I need to have in my, in my tool belt? Um, and, and I think, you know, what I want to do over the next hour or so, is just ask you some questions to maybe dig a little bit deeper about um, how you guys got to where you are. And maybe um, those of us listening can, can apply some of that knowledge uh, to better ourselves and help us accomplish and reach our goals. So, um, you know, Jerry, I think I want to start with you. Maybe you can start by just telling us, how did you get into cybersecurity in the first place? Was this a, a, a strategic career choice for you or did you just stumble into it like so many of us have? Uh, yeah. So thanks, Parm. Um, you know, I would say that uh, it, it's a little bit of both. You know, I, I, I kind of stumbled uh, upon it, but from a career path perspective, you know, even when I was, uh, you know, a, a really little kid, um, I've always, I was always interested in things around um, kind of like law enforcement and, um, you know, investigations and, and things of that nature. I, I really was. And I, I remember as a kid uh, for Christmas one year getting a fingerprint kit. And my mom had bought me a fingerprint kit, and it had, like, graphite powder in it, and it had talcum powder, and it had these little uh, strips of tape. And I would run around the house and uh, take everybody's fingerprints, and I had little fingerprint cards, and I had every, my entire family uh, fingerprinted. Um, of course, my, my protection PI, PII skills weren't that great back then, um, and uh, those eventually got out in the wild. I don't know where those cards are today, but at any rate, um, I was always kind of interested in that investigatory type of, of work and, you know, kind of going forward, getting into the, the Marine Corps and learning a little bit about things like physical security. And I just leveraged that as I got into counterintelligence in the Marine Corps um, and then leveraged those things uh, to learn more about security as a whole. I then became a private investigator. I was doing background investigations. Um, and at that point, uh, I was um, recruited by Central Intelligence Agency, and I'd always wanted to be, um, that's another place where I always wanted to be, but it was just a curiosity, like I said, around investigations and things of that nature. And while I was at the CIA is when I really kind of started getting into the cyber aspects of things. And I was one of these guys that, uh, you know, I was self-taught in a lot of ways. I was, I'm a voracious reader. Um, read everything that I that I could, and I just kept focusing on kind of the security aspects. So I went physical security, personal security, and now I'm kind of in cyber. And once I got into cyber, it was something I found that I really, really love. I just immersed myself in it, you know, all day, every day, and then just leveraged everything that I picked up skills and just leveraged that into different jobs and consulting and then back into the government. And, you know, I look back 22, 23 years later and can't believe all the places that I've been and some of the uh, great people I've met and some of the really interesting things that, that I've done. But it was a little bit by design. I was very, very purposeful driven uh, when I probably hit around, you know, 19, 20 years old about what I kind of wanted to be in the security space. And then the IT side of it came a little bit later. And here, here we are, like I said, 22, 23 years later. 
That's great. And you know, I, I, I think, I think that, you know, the keys that I picked up there are, you know, the, 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 the curiosity factor and, um, and reading, I, I, I it's something that uh, everyone, everyone I talk to that I look up to, and I think has accomplished a lot. They're all just voracious readers and are, have that constant quench to, um, for, for more knowledge and, and, and are, are always looking to learn more. And so I, and I, I know that the store friendship that, that, that applies to you, Jerry. Uh, Ron, what about you? I mean, how'd you get started on, on this incredible career path that you're on? Well, my, my journey was uh, totally by accident. I, I literally stumbled into cybersecurity. I was going to graduate school. I was an army officer back in the late uh, 1980s. I know it's a long time ago, but uh, I was going to graduate school for uh, computer science. Uh, they sent me to school to get a, a PhD in, in uh, computer science, specializing in artificial intelligence and robotics, because I was going to be a program manager for the Army's autonomous vehicle program. Well, the day before I graduate, I get a phone call from the Department of the Army, and they said, you know, the job that you thought you were going to, well, the guy that's in that job, he's decided to extend for a year. So go find yourself something else to do. And that, that was it. I, I made some phone calls to my buddies who happened to work at the National Security Agency. They said, hey, we got plenty of jobs over here at NSA. Come on over. And so in 1990, I showed up there at, at the door, couldn't get in the building because I didn't have a top secret SCI clearance at that point. But that was the start of a long 30 year journey and it was totally by accident. But the good news is that I had kind of the fundamentals that I needed to, uh, to have to get started in that business with computer science and computer engineering and some of those fundamentals. So it just meant I had to, I had to work really hard to immerse myself into that new area. But that was the start of it purely by accident. Yeah, and I, I've heard, as I mentioned earlier, I hear so many folks uh, and, and, and senior positions who uh, had no no inkling they were going to get into this career path, and here they are. And I I will be would be remiss if I didn't say, pointing out the uh, the common thread here, which is a career in government. And and if, for those of you who are looking to get into cybersecurity, uh, I got to advocate for a role in government. I know it gets a bad rap on TV, but but uh, there's a lot of opportunities there, and the government does need you. So definitely go to uh, what's the website? Is it jobs.gov? Is that where you go? I think it's usajobs.gov, I think. Usajobs.gov. Yeah, we, we, yeah. Need, we, need you, we need you over there. Um, so guys, as you look back in your career, you know, what do you think that it was that set you up for success? And maybe Ron, we can start with you. you know, what, what was it? Um, was it? Was it that curiosity? Was it a mentor? Was it the classes that you took? I mean, what do you think that it was foundationally uh, that, that allowed you to kind of achieve the goals that, that you had. Ron, maybe you can start and then Jerry, you can add on. You know, I think it's a, it's a combination of all those things. Certainly the education is important. And there, you know, the nice thing about our field in cybersecurity is there's so many different things you can do within our profession. You know, you can be, um, you can develop a secure code. You can be a security engineer. You can be working at the enterprise level, but I think my start getting the, the fundamentals, uh, what, no matter what you're doing in life, my philosophy is always get yourself grounded in the fundamentals, no matter what that is. And so for me, it was a grounding in, in computer science and in the things that kind of are at the, the heart of the system stack today. And that's where the, a lot of the security work is done. I call that below the waterline, but there's other things also that you can do that are above the waterline, but education and committing to the fundamentals, mastering the fundamentals and whatever you're doing, I think that's going to be a constant across all professions. Certainly, I was very lucky when I when I got to NSA, I couldn't get in the building for three months. I was getting my top secret SCI clearance. So they sent me to two places. They sent me to NIST to hang out for three months waiting for my clearance and also sent me to a small company called Trusted Information Systems. And that had the brain trust from people who used to work at NSA and, and some of the leading uh, founding fathers of uh, computer security worked at TIS. And then there were folks at NIST and I spent three months literally immersed in those organizations and they they were so generous of their time in mentoring me they didn't have to do that but here was a guy that didn't know i just walked in the door and they took they took hours to sit down with me they gave me a, a whole stack of books to read and said here read these first and then we'll have a conversation and so the mentoring and the, and the grounding and the fundamentals and then i think just the curiosity you, you know falling in love with something in, in a profession is the is the dream of everybody because when you love what you do, you really never have to work again in your life. That's kind of a cliche, but it's very true. So I think it's a combination of those things that kind of started me out and, and set me up for the, the journey that I was going to go on. But there's no guarantees 
of success in this world. You have to work hard and you have to be prepared for setbacks. And there's lots and lots of setbacks. And then you got to be able to keep on driving forward and pursuing your goals, no matter what they are. Yeah, that's excellent. J Jerry, how about you? Yeah, you know, so all those things that Ron said, <laughs> you know, and I think, you know, one of the big things for me was, uh, and Ron kind of talked about it at the very end there when he talked about, you know, having a love for, you know, that profession and the career. And so, you know, I translate that as to, you know, passion. I was extremely passionate um, about the career fields that I, that I was in, um, particularly, let's say, starting with, you know, when I was in the intelligence community. I was extremely passionate and loved the, the work, counterintelligence work. And it was one of those things where, again, where I just immersed myself in it and got really pretty good at it. Um, and I think what makes you, uh, you know, successful was that you have to have, again, that curiosity, but you also have to have, I think, uh, you know, self, you know, actualization, right? So you have to um, be prepared and have the discipline to start on your own and be aggressive in moving through your career path. There's a lot of people that have you know, passion and dreams and things of that nature, but um, not, they aren't self-starters, right? So you really have to be a self-starter. I always, you know, tell myself that, you know, at the end of the day, like, look, this is, this is all on you. How good you want to be and successful you want to be at whatever career field that you're in, um, you have to self-actualize. You have to jump in it and be extremely aggressive. Be curious, and as we said at the beginning, I just, I read anything and everything, no matter what profession I was in. When I got into counterintelligence, I read everything about counterintelligence and counterespionage um, and offensive operations and things of that nature and got really, really good at it um, on the teams that I, were, I was on at, at CIA. Same thing with cyber. I read anything and everything about it. And then the application of cybersecurity into different environments, I learned about those environments. And just a quick example of something like, how do you apply cybersecurity in the space environment and space architectures? Well, I went and I read books and learned about the space environment and what it takes to build, you know, a spacecraft and what are the different components and subcomponents and the whole ecosystem about space. I, I just read and was really passionate about applying security in those areas. So, but I had to, you know, um, you know, go and read and be a self-starter about that and maintain that curiosity. And I've had that my entire life and it, it served me really well. Yeah, that's great. And I, and I can attest that I think knowing both of you the way I do, those things are still with you. I, it, it seems like a lot of those are just personality characteristics, you know, that, that stay with you. Because, you know, Jerry, every time I talk to you, I, I always leave a conversation with Jerry with homework. Because he always brings something up that I haven't read yet. <laughs> um, you know, guys, so what is it that at this point, you know, in, in, in your career, I want to talk about motivation. You know, you've, you've both accomplished so much. Um, you're, 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 at, you're at, at the pinnacles, you know, in, 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 your, in, your, uh, in your careers and in your organizations. So what is it that, um, you know, motivated you to get here? And what is it that keeps motivating you to push forward at this stage? And, and Jerry, why don't we start with you on this one? Um, you know, what really continues to drive me is, again, it's that, it's that curiosity. Um, you know, it's kind of funny. I'm not a, I'm not a, 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 a big chaser of the, the motivation um, aspects of things. And I think that's the Marine Corps in me. You know, I, I've always tried to focus on being disciplined about things because motivation is really flighty, right? It comes and goes. So I try to maintain a discipline about things. So when I have that curiosity, um, the, the discipline piece of it is going out and learning about things, being disciplined about continuously trying to stay up on things and uh, look at things a different way by, again, self actualization and learning. So for me, what keeps me motivated is that, that curiosity and then the discipline of trying to learn more and how can I do, do things better or how can I do things differently and as you said earlier, you know, about giving you homework, it's like I just think there's so many different ways to look at things. And so I'm always trying to expand my, my, uh, my gray matter up here into learning new things. So it's just, it's just that innate passion and curiosity with a lot of discipline behind it to, to, keep, the, um, to keep things moving, keeping myself moving. 
I like I like looking at it as discipline. That's an interesting that's an interesting perspective. Ron, Ron, what about you? Well, for me, my journey goes way back. Uh, when I came out of high school, I, I went to the military academy, and so I, I you know had four years there at the military academy at West Point, and then twenty one years in the army. So my motivation has always been service to country, and that's very important. And I think that really. Um, it caught fire after I got out of the army and, and went into the private sector for a couple of years, maybe three or four years, and then came back into federal service. And, you know, taking the oath to the constitution, I've done that uh, uh, three times in my, in my career. And those words are very powerful. I, I see when you talk about the freedoms that we have here in this country today and how precious that freedom is, um, it really motivates me to, to try to solve these big and challenging problems. And especially today when, we see this technology that we're so blessed to have, the greatest technology in the world. It's being so, it, it, we, have, we depend on that for success in every one of our areas, whether it's the federal government, the private sector, our critical infrastructure. And so these are big problems that deal with the future of the country, our economic and our national security interests. And to me, it doesn't get any bigger or better than that. I mean, I walk out the door every morning with my dog, and I, I, I say this a lot, but it's, it sounds cliche, but I take a big, deep breath of freedom. And I'm, I'm so grateful that I've had the opportunity to serve my country for this many years. I do, I look at it as an opportunity and it's a blessing to be able to do that. And so that's kind of what drives me, uh, whether you achieve excellence or not, that's kind of a secondary thing for me. I just want to make sure that I do my job and that we, we give our, our money's worth to the American people who pay our salaries. Yeah, can't, couldn't say it, can't, can't say it any better than that. Uh, I, I, I want to shift when we were kind of uh, uh, prepping for this, and, and, and we've again talked about this over, over the years as friends. I, I want to get a little personal now, and, and, and you know, all of us in our in the course of our daily lives, um, we all go through personal adversity, and oftentimes um, it's not really appropriate to talk about at work. You don't really share certain things, uh, and we don't often see it in other people. We just look at the, the success they're having, we look at what they've achieved and how they got there. We don't really know what they had to get through to get to that point. So I was wondering to the extent that you guys are comfortable, can you share with the, with the audience, you know, an example of uh, personal adversity you've had to overcome uh, and how it impacted uh, your uh, career development uh, in good or bad ways? And, and, and Ron, why don't, we, uh, why don't we start with you on this? Well, it's a, it's a great question, Parm. And I, I think uh, I haven't uh, made any secrets about it. I've been pretty open with my uh, battle with uh, prostate cancer. It started back in 2003. And, you know, I'm sure many of our listeners today may have experienced that, but there's, there comes a point in time when something happens to you and, and it, you, you, you end up understanding you, your, your mortality. It, it, it faces you face to face and you wake up with that reality. In 2003, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer and I had surgery at Johns Hopkins, great surgeons up there, and everything was good. Uh, the surgery went well and I'm going along fat, dumb, and happy for the next seven years, every year getting my checkup. And then in 2010, my PSA test went positive unexpectedly, and that meant the cancer had come back, and everybody was shocked. But you know, the first thing I do is you go to, you go to Google search, you see what does metastatic prostate cancer mean? How, how, you know, what what's my life expectancy? And when you have that experience, it really it changes you for forever. Um, for me, it's a scary experience. But then once I was able to get to grips to grips with that, I. I looked at the treatment options and everything else, and, and, and my, I got my, my sea legs again, so to speak. And it really motivated me. It did two really powerful things. It made me appreciate all the things in this world that I hadn't been appreciated, I took for granted. And, you know, I look at, like, you see people arguing over parking spaces at the mall at Christmas time and all those things that seemed important. Those things were totally not important anymore. And you focus on family, friends, and, and for me, it motivated me to work harder. And I was lucky over the next couple of years from 2010 to 2012, getting some of the advanced uh, treatments at Johns Hopkins, the immunotherapy. And, and luckily for the last uh, eight years, I, I've been cancer free, but it's motivated me to work harder because when you're going through that experience and you, you know that you have a finite number of days left on this earth, potentially, how are you gonna spend those last days? And for me, I had a slogan, one more special pub, you know, it's kind of because that was what I've been working on for decades. And, and, and that was to me, I wanted to make that one more contribution before I left this earth. So, you know, it's those things I, I don't want to wish that in anybody, but it, it really, for me, I, I looked at this 
a kind of a positive, it changed the way I look at life to, in, in a really good and meaningful way. Yeah, thank thank you, and I I, I know uh, on behalf of everybody, we're we're, we're happy that, that your your health is back, and uh, and that's a poignant story. I think a lot of folks, health is one of those I think a lot of people can can relate to. So thanks for sharing that, Jer Jerry. What what can you share? Yeah, you know it's, it's you know I I appreciate Ron's story. It's such it's such a, a great and inspiring story. It, it really is, and and I love the the attitude about one more special pub. You you know. Um, Meanwhile, you know, on the other side of the table, sometimes when I know when I was in the federal government, I was, you know, uh, for Ron, it was an inspirational thing. And for me sitting uh, in government agency, I was like, really, another special pub? <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, it's perspective. Yeah, it's all about perspective. <laughs> I'm like, man, Ron's really cranking these things out. Um, but, uh, <laughs> At, at any rate, you know, as, as you said, there's a there's a lot of, uh, you know, there, everybody has a story is what I like to say. Everybody always has a story um, about, uh, you know, challenges and things that they've overcome and, um, and it's all perspective. And, you know, I had a, a, you know, early on, you know, as a kid, you know, I had a tremendous number of challenges um, growing up and, and um, uh, getting to where I am today. Um, you know, when I was, uh, you know, a, a young kid, you know, I'm from originally from South Bend, Indiana, so uh, the Irish. Um, and, you know, but I grew up, you know, very, very, you know, uh, you know, simply put a very poor kid in inner city of, of uh, west side of South Bend, Indiana, and uh, racially segregated environment. And, you know, um, I've told this story, many people have, told, have heard this story, you know, I've spoken about it. Um, at, uh, at, at cities, and I was the uh, keynote address, the commencement speaker at uh, Capital Technology University in 2017 for the graduating class, and um, I told them that the story, that, and people have heard it. So, you know, when I was younger, you know, one of the things that, that took place, I was in a racially segregated um, environment, and we moved into, I remember our family moved into a, uh, a predominantly uh, white neighborhood, and the first day we had that house, it was the first time my grandmother had uh, was able to, to buy a house. The day we moved in, the people in the neighborhood, they burned the house down because they didn't want us living in the neighborhood. As I moved through life, you know, there was other things, you know, I was homeless at 12 years old and lived in a state park in California, um, being out of dumpsters and things like that to, to survive. But the thing for me was I always had, I always knew for, for whatever reason in my head that, that it wasn't going to be like that for forever. Right. I always knew I always had this drive in my head, like things are not going to be like this forever. And I was 12, 13 years old and had a pretty rough upbringing, but I was always aggressive and positive. And I think the big thing for me was family. I always had the family there and we supported each other. Uh, and it got me through a lot of different things. And so when I go out and I talk to younger kids and, and even the older folks, I always say, look, you know, at the end of the day, I, I you know, I do a lot of work farm, as you know, and, um, uh, underserved communities and things like that I've done for years and said that, look, you know, if, if I can make it, it anybody can make it, <laughs> anybody can make any of these things. And, and I've gotten, I believe, to where I am in life by just uh, taking those things that I've learned. I learned about people and passion and forgiveness and things like that. And I use them every day in my life. And, and those are the things that are kind of, I think, uh, have been my, my true north for me. And it's gotten me to, to where I am today. So I look at, you know, you know, the things that I grew up with in the adversities, and I wouldn't change it for anything. I wouldn't change it for the world because it's allowed me to use it as a platform and uh, to help, you know, younger kids and, and folks who may be going through something uh, adverse uh, to say that, like, you know, you can do this. You can, you can make it through this. Um, it's not uh, it's, it's not the end, and I've always thought thought of that, and I keep those not in the back of my mind, but in the very front. No matter what adversity I'm going through, um, those things have really made me uh, uh, strong and and who I am today as a person. But like I said, I've I've told that story more than a few times in very wide open uh, forums. People have asked me to to you know present that story over and over, and and I don't mind telling people, you know, but uh, it is definitely help shape kind of who I am today in a, in a very positive way. Yeah, that's, uh, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for you and people, you know, who are, you know, willing to share their stories and Ron sharing your story, because I think 
uh, for, for, for whatever reason, people who aren't comfortable and everyone has their own path. So, you know, if people who aren't comfortable sharing these stories, that's their prerogative. But I think it's, it's empowering for folks who uh, may be in similar situations, whether it's health related, uh, you know, family related, economic related, mental health related, whatever it may be, to, to see, you know, represent, I said earlier, representation matters. And I think when you see somebody who's uh, over, overcome obstacles and, and, and challenges that you're facing and they say, you know, if they did it, I can do it too, like you just said. Uh, and I think it really, really uh, goes to show. And so I, I'm, 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 I'm happy that we, 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 we kind of covered these issues because I know when I first learned these things about you guys, it, um, uh, it, it uh, made me uh, just, you know, love you guys more than I already do, but uh, just admire you guys as professionals uh, as well. And so that's fantastic. Um, I, I want to also talk about, you know, another another reason why I, I think we all uh, appreciate each other as professionals is, is is a common belief of of standing up for what's right versus what's wrong, uh, that integrity piece of the value system I talked about earlier, uh, even when it's not always easy, uh, and even when uh, it, it may have a, uh, a, a a potential negative in the short term uh, trans impact on a transaction, right? I think we all know that integrity is how you uh, ensure uh, long-term success, and it's always the right way to live your life. But uh, when you're actually faced with a decision, uh, which could have a, 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 a you know kind of a, um, a tough short-term consequence, um, but it's the right thing to do, you sometimes don't know how to deal with it, especially if it's to your boss, right, uh, or to a client. And so I'm wondering uh, again if you guys could share some of your insights as to experiences you've had in that scenario, uh, and and how you've dealt with it. Uh, and uh, I've lost track of uh, the back and forth, so I'm going to go with my top <laughs> left corner and Ron, and you can start with that one. <laughs> Thanks, Parma. <laughs> yeah, the term integrity, I think, is the thing that comes to mind. That's one of the most important things you can have. You know, your reputation that you have as an individual with integrity and how people look at you and how you live your life, it's extremely hard to earn, and it can be lost in, a, in literally a nanosecond with the wrong things happening. And I think for me, um, it started out with having, you know, good parents that kind of instilled those, um, those values in me as a, as a kid growing up. And it was reinforced in, in my time in the military. Uh, at West Point, it was duty, honor, country, and integrity, and all those things. So it kind of get reinforced along the way. And certainly in the military, where you're responsible for soldiers' lives, uh, integrity is really what it's all about. Uh, people trust you. Uh, your lives are in their hands. Uh, they're, they're part of your family. So again, those things uh, are, are kind of inbred in, in, in my psyche uh, from, you know, very early on in my life. I think where it gets challenging is in, in jobs that we do day to day, you're going to come up with situations that are very difficult to address. And being able to speak up uh, against, uh, being, I guess the, the phrase is truth to power is what you hear people say. It's very difficult. Because some of the younger people whose jobs are at stake, uh, if they don't really trust the whistleblower system and they don't, uh, they think their their jobs are at risk or their families aren't going to be able to eat after they, you know, bring this issue up, they can get them fired. Those are real world issues, and and uh, you know, I, it's not easy to navigate those all the time. I've tried to do that to the best of my ability, and I'm probably my, more outspoken than a lot of my colleagues are at NIST, uh, and that sometimes comes back to bite you, but. Uh, you know, I can sleep well at night. I think that's the test. It, you have to be able to live with yourself and feel comfortable in your own skin and in the way you operate as an individual. And I think if you follow that path and 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 really pursue those uh, those core uh, moral uh, those kind of ways ways you deal with life, I think most people are going to find they're going to come out on the right side of that discussion. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And, and you know, both of you guys know my, my uh, I, I've had some, uh, as an entrepreneur, I've, I've had my ups and downs. And, and, uh, and you know, I, I know that what's gotten me through it is my personal reputation. And, and it goes back to the decisions that I've made and, uh, and um, that integrity piece. And, and it's really that your reputation is all you have sometimes at the end of the day. Uh, and people take that, uh, not just that one uh, uh, incident, but the entirety of your career and your decisions that you've made when, when evaluating how to move forward with something and, and, and Ron, your spot on that integrity is, is and, so cool. And Parma, I just wanted, I wanted to add one thing to that before we jump over to Jerry. Uh, yeah. I, I think the, the situation you just brought up, people are gonna find sometimes uh, friends of theirs or maybe you get into trouble. And you know, not abandoning your friends when something goes wrong in their lives, Be, being able to stick with them 
that's a pretty important thing. And maybe that goes back to the military, but I think it's a concept that is widely applicable. I know one of my role models uh, for the for the whole area of integrity is the gentleman sitting on this panel with me, who is Jerry. And I know he's got some maybe some stories to tell about that, but I'll tell you, there's nobody better at modeling integrity than, than Jerry Davis and, and his career in the federal government. I've seen him go through some extremely difficult and dicey situations. And man, he's been a rock. And I think if you wanna look up to somebody in that, in that regard, uh, he's the man right there. 100%. Jerry, with that intro, what are your thoughts? <laughs> Yeah, I certainly appreciate that, Ron. I, I, I really do. And, you know, I, I can only um, really continue to emphasize what, what Ron said about uh, integrity and um, making sure that that's something that if you don't have anything else, you know, you always hold on to your integrity. You have to be able to, um, you know, really it's, it's cliche ish, but you have to be able to look at yourself every day in the mirror. And and continue to validate and ask yourself, you know, who are you? What kind of what kind of person are you? And you know, I I, I came across some pretty pretty as Ron says, some pretty unique and um, you know challenging situations back in you know 2012 2013 that uh, in the federal government that culminated in a hearing in front of Congress. Um, and uh, that was as Ron said, a very very dicey situation. But it was a situation that for me there was no other option at the end of the day i felt like that i wasn't going to um compromise my integrity for for anyone or for anything and, it, and if it even if it meant to me um at the end of the day that it was a career ender for me you know uh, maybe in the federal government or something like that it, it i didn't care because at the end of the day what i wanted to do i wanted to leave and know that when i looked at myself in the mirror the next day that I still had my integrity, you know, intact, you know, and that's, you know, we always learn that, you know, integrity is about, you know, doing the, the right thing when no one else is, is watching you or looking at you or no one knows, but, you know, it became very public, <laughs> very quick. And, uh, you know, the, the hearing that I was in was, was, um, was resonated around the, the nation. I got a tremendous number of, of emails and kudos from people um, who took inspiration for uh, maintaining my, uh, you know, my, my, my integrity. And connected with your integrity is your reputation. You know, that's one of the other things that you, you, you have left is your brand and your reputation. And I wanted my reputation to, to, to maintain that, you know, I was an individual of high integrity. And it meant a lot to me. It meant, it meant a lot to me that I didn't mind falling on my sword uh, if it meant that I was going to maintain my integrity and I was doing something that I actually thought was the right thing uh, to do, you know, and for for the for the nation, for this for this country, I I love public service and I wanted to make sure that I was doing the the, the right thing. So you you got to hold on. I tell folks you got to hold on to to your integrity at the end of the day. And sometimes what that means is sometimes you you have to walk away from jobs. Sometimes you have to put your badge on the table and say, you know, it just doesn't have, uh, doesn't meet my, my value, uh, my value and what I value in integrity and reputation and, and things like that. And sometimes you just have to walk away from things. And um, I, I try to demonstrate that uh, in my life, not uh, on purpose, seeking those things out, but it's just as I've come across different situations that are really challenging and tough. Um, for me, it was a personal thing. I'm going to keep my integrity at the end of the day at, at all costs. And it turns out, you know, again, it, it worked out for me uh, in the long run. In the near term, it was a little tough, but it worked out for me in the long run. And uh, I can look at myself in the mirror every day. And I, I'm really proud of, of you, who I am as, as a human. <laughs> yeah, that, that's awesome. And I, I, uh, I again, I, I, I love both of those stories. Uh, I, I love both of those answers. And, uh, and I, I couldn't agree more. And I think when all of us, when we can just take a step back and think about the people that we admire, regardless of what industry, whether it's you know, in sports or on the job or just personally, that integrity uh, is, is critical. You know, these people are, are, are whether it's um, in their personal life or, or on the job. Jerry, what you said about, you kind of feel like they're going to do the right thing, whether someone's watching or not. And, and then you hear about a good story gets out of them when they thought nobody knew this, but they did this 
incredible act of kindness or generosity and did the right thing when they thought no one was watching. That's why we love them so much. And that's, that's, that's exactly the way we should all, if everyone lived their life that way, what a, what a wonderful world this would be, right? <laughs> um, I, 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 want, I want to also sh kind of sh shift a little bit to talk about uh, an issue that everyone's talking about right now, which is, which is um, uh, racial uh, equality and, and, and equality across the board. Uh, and, and Jerry, I, I obviously we'll start with you on this one. You and I have talked very candidly over the years around you know, your experiences about being the only black executive uh, in a room, whether it's in the government or in the commercial sector, and what, what that must feel like um, and, and how you navigate that, and also how you've been able to affect change uh, in, in that. And, and, um, and, and Ron, you, know, you and I have talked about what you're able to do for, uh, for female candidates in the cyberspace. And so, uh, Jerry, can you start by sharing, you know, what is that, what is that like and, and, and how, how do you navigate that, particularly for other, other um, uh, people from underrepresented communities watching who are feeling what you felt and, and, and wanna know what if it's ever gonna change and how they can navigate that in their career? Yeah, um, I, I appreciate this topic and it's, it's we all know it's, it's interesting that, you know, it's really uncomfortable for people. Right. Uh, when you talk about things like uh, race and, and diversity, um, it's a very, very uncomfortable topic for people. And um, to get through it, you just have to kind of uh, learn to be uh, being comfortable uh, being uncomfortable. And, you know, I think that's something that, you know, physically I learned in the Marine Corps about learning to be uh, comfortable uh, when you're in uncomfortable situations. And so, you know, the majority of my career, particularly as I became a, a senior executive, you know, I was a fairly, I think, relatively young senior executive. I was 36 or 37 years old in the federal government. Um, and, and many organizations that I've been in, I, I have, you know, I, 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 I would call it, you know, I would go into a room and I would count the number of people in there um, that were, you know, uh, like me, that were maybe African-American. And, and I'd always say, well, there was, uh, you know, 40 people in the room and me, <laughs> you know? And I've always, every agency I worked at, when I was at Central Intelligence Agency, um, you know, I was in a director of operations. I was from desk and service officer. Um, I was the only African-American on the team, you know, the, and, and within the director of operations is a very, very small cadre of African-Americans that go into that. When I got to NASA, I remember walking to NASA, I was the only African-American executive in the, in the CIO's office. And I remember, you know, NASA, I don't remember exactly what the stats are today, but I believe it's like at the time, like 75, 76% white males. And so I remember one of the first meetings I had at NASA headquarters and the administrators in there, and I walk in in 2007, 2008, one of the first uh, big executive meetings, and I remember walking in and, and I felt like everybody was looking at me, right? You get this uncomfortable feeling that everybody is looking at you. Um, and maybe you think you're in the wrong room or they think you're in the wrong room. And I remember how uncomfortable I felt. And I've had that in, in, in other areas of, of organizations that I've worked on where, as I say, I, it's, I'm the only one in, in, in the room and, and at the table. And what I, what I try to articulate to um, other uh, you know, folks of, of color is that, you know, you can very quickly get into an imposter syndrome situation where you don't believe that you belong there. But what I always try to reiterate to you again, folks of, of color is that um, every room that you in, you're in, you, you belong there. There's a reason why you're there in that room. You know, there's a reason why they, they hired you. And you have to take your solace and be confident in that and say like look i i belong here i'm here because i belong here it's it's not easy and every once in a while i get oddball thoughts that creep in my head when i sit going to a room and i may may own the entire organization but i sit down to the table with with the, you know my leaders and that sort of thing and sometimes you know you get that in your you can get that really quickly in your head but again i always you know go back to um my my own thoughts of you belong here. There's a, there's a reason why you're in the room and you're, you're belo you belong here. And that's a message that I continuously, you know, preach to anybody in, in any situation, you know, regardless of color, gender, that sort of thing. If you, if you've got the, the, the imposter syndrome going in your head, you know, uh, you, you belong in the room, you know, and just keep telling yourself that. Yeah. 
I love that message. We've talked about that, and that's uh, that's so important for uh, particularly for you know people of of color uh, and, and women in this industry, but for anybody who's uh, who's feeling that. Uh, if, if, if you got in there, my, my, my father actually would always tell me that as well. He's like, Parham, he would always tell me when I was younger, he's like, if, if you got the job, if you got the opportunity, they see something in you that you may not see in yourself yet, but don't doubt yourself. You got there for a reason, own it. He would always tell me that growing up. Uh, yeah. Ron, you know, you obviously have a, a different perspective on, on this topic, but you know, what, what are your thoughts on what, what's going on and how have you enabled, you know, movement uh, towards the right direction in this? Well, this is, a, this is a very turbulent time for the country as everybody's seeing, watching on TV and just experiencing, you know, I go back a long, long time. I was raised in, in the Southwest and in California. And my parents, uh, I didn't really understand anything about racism. My parents, uh, I think, raised me uh, to be colorblind. And, and my mom used to sit down and say, hey, you treat everybody the same. You know, you, you just, uh, there's a biblical saying, love thy neighbors, you know, as you love yourself. And and I think those are important, just fundamentals. And I, I know that this discussion is hard for people to have. Um, certainly nobody can walk in, in you know, Jerry's footsteps. Only Jerry can do that. But I think from my perspective, uh, instead of trying to solve all the problems, I like to look at things on a case-by-case -case basis. Reach out, have the conversation with friends, people who you, uh, you know, associate with. I've never been afraid to have a conversation, I think, because in my heart, I know that I do treat everybody the same, and, and I, it's, I, I don't have that kind of negativity to start with. But having said that, there are problems out there, and we have to face those problems. I think having a better understanding, you know, it's all about communication and, and being able to sit down and have that one-on-one -on -one conversation with a friend or a colleague, just to understand um, perspective. What does it look like from their side of the fence? You know, that's the thing we forget sometimes. You know, you you can look around and you see things from your eyes from, the, from this side, but there's someone else who is experiencing something from the other side that sees things totally different. And having that conversation, I think, on a one-on-one -on -one basis, they, you know, individuals can make a difference. I've always felt that. And so you can have that conversation with your, your center circle with fa family and friends and people who you associate with. Make, make, make this place better one person, one day at a time. And I think if everybody did that, we'd be a whole lot better off than we are today. And I, I do believe that, you know, overall, we're going to get to a good place. It may take us a while to get there, but that's the beauty of this country, you know, with the freedoms that we have. And if we go back to the Constitution and we really live up to our ideals, I think we are going to get to the right place. So I'm very optimistic on that regard. And I try to work hard every day to, to do my part. And, and that's really all I can do. Yeah, that's great. Th these are, these are great sentiments. And, uh, and I, I agree. I, I, uh, I, I feel, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a, uh, an immigrant here. I was born overseas, uh, you know, grew up in, in the Midwest uh, during a time when Middle Easterners were, were not uh, kind of demonized on TV for the, the different Gulf Wars. And uh, uh, you know, Ron, I couldn't agree more. I think the, the core of this nation is about love and respect and, and, and kindness and, and, and empathy. And um, uh, it's through these one-on-one -on -one conversations and and candor and 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 on certain cases, you know, being a little bit brave and maybe asking questions that you're not sure what kind of answer you're going to get and if you're going to sound dumb asking it, but you got to ask it anyway. <laughs> I think that's what we got to do more and more of to break down these barriers and these stigmas and make progress forward. So I think that's those are. Those you are know, Harm, one other thing you were asking about women in cybersecurity. We everybody knows we have a real shortage of cybersecurity professionals today. So when you look around. We really need to go out far and wide and try to find everybody we can who has that seed of passion that can end up you know, doing things like Jerry's done and, and I've been involved in over the last uh, three decades. Now at NIST, we've been very fortunate. I, I'm surrounded on the FISMA team with incredibly smart and strong female cybersecurity professionals. And so you know, we try to do what we can. In other words, you gotta walk the walk, not just talk the talk. And there's an incredible talent base out there of females in the minority community. We have to tap into that because there are so we can do so much more if we make sure that folks have the opportunity to pursue their dreams, their passions, good education, coming out, having a good mentor, just having someone to sit down with them and kind of show them the way. I mean, that's something we all really need and want in our lives. And some of us have been fortunate to have that and some some folks, unfortunately, have not been that fortunate. Well, that's a, that's a great segue, actually. I, I wanted to talk about 
you know, you've done, you've both done so much to give back to the cybersecurity community and give back to the technology community. Um, talk about the, the importance of, of, uh, of giving back and, and, and uh, not only uh, why it's important to you, but um, what people who are listening can do. Because I think sometimes we feel like it's either a huge burden, it's a huge ask. Maybe some people feel like they have to be at a certain level to do so and they're not qualified to do it. So share your thoughts and maybe inspire the, the, you know, all the folks listening to get involved in what they can do. And, and uh, Ron, we can, we can start with you. You know, mentoring and giving back, uh, two of the most important things I think people can do, especially as you get into the mid part of your career and the later part of your career. I'm so grateful to have had the opportunity to do what I've done for a long time, but I've always tried to make sure that I'm available to anybody who is asking for help. It's a really simple concept. If somebody comes to you with a question or something that's troubling them, take some time to sit down and just have a conversation. I do this all the time at conferences. I, I, I shared a story with you, I think, about the young man. I was speaking at a conference one time, and he came up after I spoke, and he said, hey, I have, I'm, I'm working on my, I think it was his PhD at the time. Uh, I'm really struggling to try to find a topic. And so we sat down for an hour after the conference, someplace away from all the hubbub, and we talked, had a long conversation about topics. We exchanged information. And then I got a call from him about six months later saying he was you know, moving along in the program. He was getting ready to uh, you know, finish all of his classwork and he had his topic, his research was going well. And then I didn't hear from him for another 18 months. And I get a phone call one day from the young man and he said, I have great news. I just graduated, I passed my dissertation, my, my exams, my dissertation was accepted and I, I got my PhD and he said, I wanted to thank you for that. And I said, look, I, I'm really happy that you, you know, were able to go through that. It's a long road, I know. And he, he put a lot of hard work into that. So the next day, the doorbell rings and there's a big package on my front door and I bring it in. And I think most of you all know that I'm a huge race car fan. I love NASA and NASCAR. Those are my two passions. And a huge NASCAR fan, love racing. So this package on my door, I bring it inside. He sent me a huge road race set from Amazon. So, you know, now, and Jerry knows, because being a federal employee at one time, you know that we have t integrity. We have ethics, very strong ethics rules. So I knew this cost more than 20 bucks. And so I had to <laughs> send the... I had to send the, the young man an email thanking him very much for his thoughtfulness. And I said, I have to send it back. Unfortunately, I, I explained why. And so uh, that's an example of how sometimes one small conversation you have with one person, you don't know the impact. Planting that seed, it may come to fruition a year or two or three later. And so that's to, that was the lesson that I learned early. And I try to make myself available as much as I can to anybody who needs help. I can attest to that because I called Ron on one Saturday uh, when I was starting my career about 10 years ago. I texted Ron. He said, text me or call me anytime. I texted him on a Saturday morning and uh, about uh, 800-153 and I said, I have some questions. And he, I was on the phone with him about an hour later for an hour on a Saturday morning uh, getting a one-on-one -on -one tutorial. So that's, uh, that, I'm sure there's hundreds of people uh, who, can, who can share, uh, share stories that are similar. Jer Jerry, what about you? What are, you, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, exactly. Um, not um, uh, uh, really different from what Ron has said is, is, at all. And, and one of the things I, I think people can do um, that I've done is, is what Ron said is I make myself available, you know, um, and sometimes I've done it to a fault where I just make, I make myself available. I may have been at a conference, uh, you know, when I've done, you know, uh, any kind of speaking, I always put my email and phone number up there and I tell folks, I'm like, oh, if you got questions, call me, particularly with, you know, the younger generation of people who are trying to get into information technology or they're trying to get into cybersecurity um, or they just need guiding. Yeah, I always tell folks, just call me. And, and like I said, there's never been a shortage of phone calls or, you know, emails after those. And I really, really enjoy, I do it out of the goodness of my heart because I, you know, as I was coming up and I look at folks when they ask me for help or they have opinions and they want perspective, um, I always kind of wish that I, that I had that kind of kind of come up. I got it later, a little bit later in my career. Um, but I, you know, I want to be that person that I want it for other folks, you know, and, you know, 2017, you know, my last year with the federal going into my last year with the federal government, um, 
you know, I, I did about 100,000 air miles around the United States and uh, going to underserved communities and schools and that sort of thing and, and talking to kids and telling the kids, hey, you can, uh, you can always contact me and that sort of thing. And um, it, it's great. Like, Ron, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a few of them that will stay in contact with you over time. And I've seen some that I've talked to in high school who are now through college and they're moving on with their careers and they're doing great things. And, and some of them have said, you know, it's all because, you know, Jerry, you made yourself available to me, you know, and I have a lot of people that I mentor. Um, I would tell folks, you know, go out and, and volunteer. If it's really something in your heart that you want to do, volunteer and, and help people and be a, be a guiding light and a true north for, for individuals because, um, there's a shortage. People need mentors and mentorships and someone to kind of help them and guide them along uh, in their careers, whether they're in elementary school, you know, or high school or college, or even people who are in their professional careers. I try to always make my, myself available. And like I said, sometimes I've done it to my detriment, but it makes me, it motivates me to be able to help people. And so, and that's, that's why I do it. Simply that's why I do it. A little bit selfish. <laughs> I think in this case it's okay. In this case it's okay. And I think for all of you listening, again, I think the point here is, you know, if you guys are doing public speaking, if you guys are out there, um, make yourselves available. Um, there, there's all, there's always going to be somebody that can learn from you. Uh, I say this all the time when I do public speaking, particularly uh, at, an, at an award show like our the ICIT gala that we we, we did every year. Um, you know, you don't have to be a general or an admiral or a CIO or a CEO to, you know, to bring about change. We're talking about this on the, on the diversity issue. You know, all of us have a sphere of influence and we can, we can bring about change and it just takes that one person. And in the context of mentorship, there's always gonna be somebody that can learn from you and your experiences. And so make yourselves available and you can, you can make a difference. Guys, we're, we're, we're just about out of time. So we're gonna go through the last couple of questions pretty rapidly. I think this next question is, I think just people will be curious to know, so who are some of the folks that have inspired you during the course of uh, your career? Uh, Jerry, we'll start with you. I mean, that's, that's, it's really tough. Um, well, it's not really tough. Uh, when I think about my career, um, my career is really, I define it by who I am as an individual, right? And uh, the person that, you know, that really de defined me, that ultimately defined my career is my grandmother. You know, it was my grandmother. My grandmother instilled, you know, very, very um, deep, uh, strong values in us as people. And again, this is a lady who, you know, worked three jobs and, and stood on her feet and uh, was impoverished and bought a home for the first time. And the first day she had it, someone burned it down. This, and, and who taught us that said at the end of the day, hey, you know, the, the world is not, not everybody is like this. Don't let a few individuals, uh, you know, jade you and paint you, paint you in your mind and think that everybody's bad. You know, my grandmother gave me extremely great values about integrity and being confident in who I am as, as a person. So um, that, that's the person who's inspired me, inspired me the most. I love it. Uh, yeah. Ron? Well, for me, it's uh, pretty easy. I, I've talked about this a lot in some of my public speaking engagements. It's, it's President John F. Kennedy and his uh, famous speech, I think it was in 1961, uh, saying that we were going to go to the moon and do other things by the end of the decade, not because they were easy, but because they were hard. That was an inspirational speech, motivational speech for bringing the best and the brightest of the American people together to do the impossible in less than eight years. And you know, you talk about motivation and how, and at NASA itself, where, where, where Jerry worked, everybody knew what the mission was from the head of the, from the head of NASA all the way down to the famous story of President Kennedy's trip uh, that he took to NASA. And he was walking down the hall and he came across a janitor pushing a broom and he, and he came up to the individual and said, what do you do here at NASA, sir? And he said, uh, Mr. President, I'm helping put a man on the moon. That, that, that shows you how deep that mission statement was going from the director of NASA all the way down. Everybody counts in, in an organization. Everybody is doing their thing to help us accomplish the mission. That's true in the military. It's true at NASA. It's true at NIST. Wherever you go, everybody counts and everybody has an important job and should be valued. And I think that's the message I took away uh, from that experience. And it's, it's kind of guided me ever since. 
Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, we're going to get to our, our last question. I want to acknowledge that we've been getting a lot of ch chat comments coming in as people saying how much they enjoy the comments you guys are making, how inspiring this is. Um, you guys will be receiving an email afterwards with the link to be able to um, reach out to us to learn how to be involved. That We've got a, a question about um, mentorship you know, programs and opportunities. We have that here at the Collaborative, uh, uh, ironically enough, but you'll be getting uh, uh, an email address, I believe, from us on the follow-up to learn more about engaging. Thank you, everybody, for seeing all these great comments. We appreciate it. Um, guys, um, I, I want to thank you guys for your time. And, and I think the, the way that I want to end this is by asking, you know, what advice you have for listeners um, who are on the path there, regardless of where they're at in their career, they want to go to the next level, they have goals, they're trying to get there, um, maybe they're not getting there fast enough, they want to go, go, go a little bit more rapidly. What advice do you have for them to, uh, to uh, you know, uh, reach their dreams? Um, Ron, we'll start with you. Jerry, we'll finish off with you. I think I would keep it very simple. I said, um, I would say, you know, get grounded in the fundamentals of whatever you would like to do in this world. Whatever your passion is, start out, get grounded in the fundamentals, become good at that. Uh, don't try to do too much. Uh, have small successes, build on those successes. And don't be afraid to take reasonable risks. That's something that people uh, sometimes don't want to do. They're risk averse. And, you know, if you're not taking uh, great risks, sometimes you, those great opportunities aren't going to be there. So that, that's what I would uh, advise any young person starting out. That's excellent. Uh, Jerry, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I would say that, um, one, it's stay focused, right? Stay focused on, on your passion. Um, I would say number two is be a forever student. Learn, learn, learn all the time. Listen and learn. Um, you're, you're never at a point in your career, you're never at the top where you can't continue to learn something. And that's something that is, is big to me. Always, always reach out and, and try to learn, learn things and learn new things. Um, the last thing I, I would say is about being humble and having humility. Um, I like to tell myself when people say, you know, I've had, you know, I've done, you know, interviews and I've had, you know, really nice articles and things written about me. Um, I try to keep humility and always tell myself, don't, don't believe your own hype, right? At the end of the day, don't believe, don't believe your own hype and, and, and stay humble. That'll keep you humble. Good great, advice. great. Yeah, good advice, guys. Well, Ron, Jerry, I, I'm, I can't thank you enough for your time. I know you guys are very busy and a lot of folks ask for, for, for time with you. Um, I'm excited for all of the attendees because um, I learned from these guys a, a lot through our personal conversations and I've always wanted an opportunity to share uh, the things that I've learned uh, with, 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 with uh, um, the broader community at large. So um, uh, I'm really excited that you all had a chance to hear from them. And I wanna thank you all for your time. Again, this was our first out of what will become a series of these leadership profiles. My name is Param Eftikari, and we'll see you on our next uh, edition. Uh, be safe, treat each other kindly, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.